member of the infrastructure engineering organization that supports that EDO. So that's one of the things that uh, you can uh, know about me that Dave didn't say. Lisa, you want to add anything? Yeah, so um, I'm a data analytics architect. So um, my history is mostly in what I would call data wrangling, dealing with large, large sets of data. Um, so I've been with Nationwide, oh gosh, only about four months, so I'm relatively new to the Nationwide family. Awesome place to work, by the way, I love it. So um, I've done a lot, of, I have a lot of history of basically um, creating standards for large organizations. So, um, you know, if you have a large company like Nationwide, and I've worked for much larger, three larger companies than Nationwide, um, the problem, one of the main problems that you have is there's data kind of everywhere and a whole bunch of different formats and a whole bunch of different lines of business. And everyone wants to do everything differently, but what you, where you can really get value out of your data is by being able to connect all that data together. So having uh, a good architecture strategy that's consistent across the entire enterprise is really beneficial. So that's kind of my primary role there. Um, so we're going to talk about what is data science. So the first thing we thought we'd do, like everybody does, you throw up a definition, right? So a data, science, a t data scientist is a person, he's got me off the top. Your mic's way too hot. I yeah. really need to move it down. Move it down. No, not you. They need oh. to move the, uh, the volume down. So if we can find which one it is that I am, I might be able to turn it down over here. He left. <laughs> okay, so I'll hold it down here. And <laughs> yeah, it's going to be really low. Wait. Mine doesn't seem to be working too well at all. Wait on so. it. Okay, so a data scientist is a person employed to analyze and interpret complex digital data, such as the usage of statistics, a website, especially in order to assist a business in its decision making. So probably that's pretty... Sounds correct to you guys, right? You could also say that a data scientist builds models that captures the behavior of a complex system or set of processes, and the data, not a data scientist, but the data science group or, or organization or field is all about collecting the data that that data scientist needs. And so we talk about the data science as a group being a team sport. There are a lot of roles that are necessary, not just the data scientist. Yep. But a lot of people say, when they talk, they say, think like a data scientist. And they may really be set trying to say, think like a data science player. And they also say, think like data scientist. Typical background, though, of a data scientist would be a PhD. It would usually be somebody who has a math, statistics, computer science degree. Um, you'll find that there are a lot of courses that you could take to learn how to build databases. Okay, now? Great. Okay, so a lot of courses that you could take, but there are very few um, colleges or universities that literally have a major program or a master's program that is called data scientist. And it's a little bit like, if you think back 50 years ago, you can't think back 50 years, most of you, but uh, 50 years ago, they didn't really even have computer science degrees and majors. And so what they did is they recruited people who had good logic thinking skills, math, science, statistics, philosophy. We were talking about that last time, how there are a lot of philosophy majors that are actually out there in the data science field. Anybody who's got that logical thinking. And so um, we talk about if, uh, if the education prepares you to think about data, to challenge data, to understand models, uh, to put all that together, do you have to have that education to have that mindset? And we say, no, you don't. Exactly. So um, I will tell you right now, I am not a data scientist. So who in this room is not a data scientist? All right. <laughs> who in this room is a data scientist? I don't want to just count this. Woo, there we go. One of our nationwide data scientists. Um, who here would consider themselves like a data engineer or data wrangler, as I call it? That's like that's kind of historically what I do. I just deal with massive amounts of data and just uh, kind of swim and sometimes drown in it a little bit. Um, so you know, I'm not a data scientist, and that's okay. You do not have to be a data scientist to help contribute to data science within your organization. Like you said, it's a team. Like Dorian said, it's a team sport. And there are a whole lot of roles that have to be played in there. Um, so, you know, what we wanted to kind of bring was, you know, well, okay, how can I contribute to data science in my organization? What can I do to enable uh, data analytics capabilities? 
Uh, so, you know, one of the top things you can think about is really um, knowing your industry. So. Absolutely. Knowing business. And so whatever the business is that you are in, that's what we mean when we say know the business. Know the processes, the flows, the data, the customers. Know when something's wrong almost by intuition. Uh, in fact, oh, we have some examples we're going to give you about. There were a lot of people doing data science analytics and they didn't even know what they were doing because they had this intuition and they knew their business so well. I'll give you a blue collar example. So my dad, who was a manual laborer, used to say, listen to your machine. Your machine will tell you when it is in good health. Your machine will tell you when there's something going wrong. And if you'll listen to it, you'll be able to keep it from having a major breakdown. And it's a lot easier to do a minor repair than a major breakdown. So these days, we would get a data scientist and we'd get a data engineer and they'd go and they'd talk to that person who understands that machine that they're working with and they'd say, oh, there's frequencies and there's you know, different kinds of noise that I hear. And they'd put together, they collect a bunch of data, they'd create a data model. You would then bump that model up against a working machine and basically watch for variations. You would want somebody who knows the business to know what your guidelines of variations are when I should say, okay, pull that machine out and take it over to the maintenance shop and do maintenance on it. So examples like that that says the person, he had no idea, he was not a very educated person, had no idea of what he was doing was analytics and predictive analytics. Yeah. Got another example. Yeah, another example, actually, it came across, uh, I added it to our, to our presentation last week. Um, I was at the Gartner Data Analytics Summit in Dallas last week. Uh, with a couple colleagues and one of them uh, the night before was out to dinner with one of his buddies who lives in Dallas and he said you know this is a kind of funny story my one of my buddy he works for the uh, city of Dallas for Fort Worth um, like either I don't know works for the city repairing water mains and things like that and he has spreadsheets in Excel you know blue collar worker that drives around a truck and fixes them um, of knowing which ones are gonna if there's a lot of rain he knows exactly which ones are gonna break based on the history uh, based on how old it is, based on a whole bunch of other facts, and he has it all in Excel. And he's talked to the city and said, hey, you know, you should maybe automate some of this. We could send crews out to, to swap out parts and things before we get a heavy rain so that we don't have a big water main break and have a massive, you know, floods. Like, well, we don't have the funding for that, for that is what he gets back, of course, right? Um, so, but, you know, just that, and what we, are, what we were talking is like, he goes, you know, my buddy's actually doing predictive analytics, right? With just his knowledge of the industry and Microsoft Excel, which quite frankly, I know we talk about all these fancy tools, that is probably the most widely used data analytics tool. Who uses Excel on a regular basis? Yeah, I do too. Um, it's not as pretty as a lot of other tools. So, so obviously those predictive analytics are gonna be different depending on the yep. industry that you're in. The norms or the guidelines, that six sigma of what's tolerant is gonna be different depending on what industry you're in. But if you know the business and you're a part of that, you know that data flow, you may even be an owner of some of that data. You could watch that data, maybe even sometimes uh, take that to other to the to your IT department, to your enterprise data operations department, and talk about how you have seen patterns, and you've seen and you've been able to do predictions. So that's how a data non-data scientist basically walks into the realm of data science. Yeah. And a lot of the discussions we're having, at least within Nationwide, is the topic of data stewardship. You know, um, you know, me and the IT organization. I don't know the insurance business as much as I would like but I have folks on the business side that know the business, know our customers better than I do. And, uh, you know, and while I may you know, be in charge of the systems that deal with the data, uh, I, I need good stewards to be the data stewards that understand the data. They, they can look at the data and tell me if it's clean or not. They can tell me what it really means. They can explain it to me in plain English. And they can make sure that we have consistent data you know, across the enterprise because they are the actual stewards of the data. Uh, and we're actually trying to start up a formal data stewardship kind of program, um, hopefully at some point, so that you know we have so we have that notion of you know not someone that someone that owns the physical infrastructure of the data, but someone that actually owns the logical data itself and can really explain it. And so that's where knowing your industry, uh, that's how you can play a key in data science because you can talk to the data scientists, to the analytics organizations that know the technology piece and explain to them the business side of things. So they can really make good use of the data. So how can you, how else can you think like a data scientist? So we say, be curious. So what, what can you look around and notice? Notice when it's working correctly, notice when it's, notice patterns, uh, notice changes in those patterns, question, uh, the next one says, I think, ask questions. 
So if you see changes in patterns or changes in data, ask a lot of questions. What's going on? Asking questions to bring in new data to validate some of the old data or to help explain why you, you are seeing changes in data. Um, we were talking about an example of how many either have or did something that we at Nationwide we call it Smart Ride. It's a little device that you put in your car. It collects data analytics about how, how often you drive, what time you're driving, how fast you drive, how hard you brake. Have you ever had one of those? Or one of those Doesn't have to be nationwide. It can be another yeah, That's yeah, fine. Yeah. You ever have a car race your hand? I have one in my car right now. Actually. Yeah, so yeah. in fact, with, with nationwide, if you just put it in, they'll give you a, a discount. And then depending on your how you drive, you may get a better discount. So anyway, uh, so, so recently. I don't get much of a discount. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, recently I was in Atlanta for two weeks. Who's driven in the Atlanta area? Yeah. I saw some area going, yeah. Um, so, I mean, you know, me and my Midwest driving, I'm driving along, and people are going 75 and 85, and when they change lanes, they do a perpendicular right, and they do a perpendicular left, and it's like they signal it in mid-movement, you know? Like, what the hell are these people doing, you know? And so, if you looked at my analytics on my driving, you would see, whoa, look at all this hard braking she's doing, and look at all this, like, slow up, you know, fast, that slow, what's going on with this person? And so you would ask a lot of questions. And then you, if you had different data, you might even be able to answer those questions without talking to me. So uh, a good data scientist is gonna say, what data could I use to kind of explain this? Well, let's look at where she was. Do we have information about where the car was at the time? Oh, look, it's not in her home region. Maybe she didn't know the area very well, and she's having to read signs or whatever. Uh, or, oh, look, we found out that there were a lot of accidents in the area that day or a lot of congestion. Then you might say, well, why were there accidents that day in the area? And so let's pull in maybe some weather data. So now the weather tells me that there was ice or there was fog or there was something else going on that actually caused a lot of really bad traffic that day. So more data to asking the questions will make you say, why and where did it come from and what other data can I use to look at that? Knowing the business will also help you say, ah, if I really want to know what's going on here, I know I have to look at that process, or I have to look at this customer por portion of the business. So it's, it's marrying those two together. Be curious, ask questions. Uh, another one is challenge assumptions. You talked about what if we had, uh, you know, my location information in the tracking. Um, we don't store that today. I don't believe, I think. Yeah, we don't store that today. I had to double check. Um, we don't store that today because, you know, it's expensive. That's a lot of data. Uh, and then, you know, challenge comes of why. Why can't we store that today? Um, you know, a lot, and so the, nor, a lot of our assumptions, ha especially in the insurance and finance, a lot of history in the finance industry is due to regulations and security. Um, you know, using cloud technologies adds a lot of availabilities and adds a, can help uh, reduce a lot of expenses. You know, wh why can't we put our data in the cloud? You know, is there a reason why not? Challenge, you, we can't, it's not secure, is what you, know, you sometimes hear from your security folks. And then you ask, why not? What can we do to make it secure in the cloud? And so that's where it's really good to challenge assumptions. Just because you've always done something some way, it, no reason to keep doing it that way. That doesn't mean you have to change, right? Because sometimes, you know, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, but, you know, challenge assumptions and challenge the status quo. Always look at new ways to do things and new data you could collect and more questions that you could possibly ask. That kind of goes back to the be curious. Um, also, always consider your business value. Um, a little story about this. Uh, I worked for a financial services organiza organization a number of years ago um, for online banking. Um, many of you are probably a customer of that website. Uh, but uh, one thing we used to tweet, I used, we used to track is every action that every person did on the website, whether they were enrolled or not. So even you tried to enroll in online banking, we would log everything you did. Uh, back then, we didn't have a lot of the big data technologies we had today, so that was all stored in a database, which can be very expensive. We got a lot of flack for what's the business value of storing all this data. Well, at one point in time, we were noticing uh, just because, literally, I was just happened to look at a report one morning for no apparent reason, no reason whatsoever, and I noticed there was a huge spike in this graph. This is why I love visual analytics, because spike and graph mean something, right? If you look at a bunch of numbers, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. That's why I love visual analytics. Um, but, you know, a spike in a graph of failed attempts to enroll on the website. I mean, massive spike. And so, well, what's going on? We also noticed 
man, are, are the web servers for the website are about 30, 40% CPU utilization higher than they normally are. That data we also had to fight to store and maintain a history of all that data. Um, ended up, after doing some digging, ended up finding, finding, looking actually into the logs at the actual data. I was looking at the fail enrollments. They were coming from about four different IP addresses. And all of the account numbers, the end of the account number was 001, then 002, then 003. And the IP addresses were coming from uh, Russia. So, you know, which is not where we have a lot, where that company had a large customer base, okay? So, you know, come to find, so this was an attempt at just randomly trying to enroll, just find accounts that existed that were not already enrolled in the site and trying to create new enrollments to then obviously, you know, take money out of people's accounts. We are able to cut off those IP addresses. And so the business value of that, you know, was just imagine if it were just five or 10 people's accounts that were hacked. Just think of the, what that would cause um, you know, from an expense standpoint to help fix the problem, get people's, their money back. And three, just the lost opportunity, you know, you, you lose customers when that kind of stuff happens. And brand um, So, you know, so it was a hard, so I, it was a hard sell to, you know, why, why are we storing all this data? What are we going to do with it? You know, but once I was, once we actually had a reason, you know, here's why we store this data. It was never a problem to store more data like that ever again. Um, so, you know, you always want to consider the business value of what you're doing. Don't necessarily just do something because it's cool, or don't think, you know, if someone says, well, that's going to cost a lot of money, I can't. Think about, okay, well, how, you know, how, why, how is this saving us money, or what's the, what is the opportunity of it? Um, so you always want to consider the business value of, of what you want to do. So um, next topic, well, I don't know data science. I'm not a data scientist. I could not implement a k-means clustering algorithm. Um, hey, but you know what it is. I know what it is, is <laughs> but I couldn't implement I know the term, but I couldn't implement it. You know, I am not, I do not have a degree in statistics. I took a couple stats classes in college 20-something years ago, uh, but that's about it. So, but, you know, remove self-blockers. Don't think you can't do it just because you don't have an education in it. Uh, there's this amazing thing called Google uh, that teaches you all kinds of cool stuff, right? Uh, I was able to fix my, the, uh, my, I had a Nissan Pathfinder. Actually, I still have this 2002 Nissan Pathfinder. It's not the car I drive every day anymore, but I just, I can't get rid of it because it keeps running. Um, but a transistor in the climate control system has gone out on me twice, and it's a $10 part or $200 to take it to the dealership to fix. I went, literally went on YouTube, and they showed you how to take the dash off, how to pull, literally that you just pull the, you unscrew the part, pull it out, put the new resistor in, and plug it in. And I don't even know how to change my oil, okay? So, <laughs> but you know, just by YouTube, I was able to do that. You know, you, you can learn how to do these things. Uh, and so, uh, using cloud capabilities, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, they all have tools that you can use to actually help visually um, do some of this analytics yourself, you know, and, and you can, and you can try not, we're not going to replace data scientists. So for any data scientists in the room, uh, you know, but what you can do, you can use your data scientists as mentors and as trainers to help you, help give you ideas and helps get you on the right path. And you can use some of this stuff yourself. And because I just love doing technical demos, I will, if I can get it to work right, I will do a, a I'll just show you a little bit. You know, just for a brief example of how, you know, you can do some of this data science yourself, how we do it on time. And if you really are interested in education, there are a lot of, uh, Amazon has a lot of really great, really cheap, uh, like you can become a, uh, a Amazon architect, cloud architect, or it's like $200, you know, it's a, like a 12 week commitment kind of deal. Uh, so there's a, a lot of Are you seeing my screen now? I hope so. Let me end the show. So. Uh, Alaska vacation. Yeah. Sometimes you got to get away from technology, man. I don't know about you guys. When I go on vacation, I like cruises because my phone doesn't work. So, um, so this is Azure Machine Learning Studio, and I is it showing on the screen? Oh no, I'm not. It should be duplicating. So let me. There we go. Duplicate. There we go. Uh, so this is a Azure Machine Learning Studio, and so you know, tools like this. And to be a, a, Google, a, a player, Amazon has the, has the same thing. AWS has Amazon Machine Learning as well. Uh, they have different tools. I'm just more familiar with this because, um, well, before Nationwide, I worked at Microsoft, so I'm a little biased, but um, just, just slightly. I know how the sausage is made. You guys all know how that works, right? Uh, so 
you know, with this, for this particular example, um, I use this example, I have a, a small set of data, and again, this isn't the, gonna be the best machine learning because it's just a small set of data, um, that I'm a, I'm a big fan of wine. Who, who likes wine? All right. <laughs> There you go. And so um, I actually make it as a hobby. So it's just, it's a science thing. It's not, you know, a, necessarily a drinking thing. Um, <laughs> so, but, you know, there's a lot of aspects of, of wine. You know, there's the acidity, there's the type of acid, there's the sugar, there's the chloride. There's all kinds of different metrics chemically that you can look at. And then you have, um, a, and then we have a quality metric in my, in my test data here that has what, kind of what the rating was from a 1 to 10 scale. And so what you can do is I'm doing um, some analytics, sorry, I'm not really analytics, some machine learning here to estimate what the score would be. So what you do when you do machine learning, basically you, can you guys, it's not big enough, let me zoom that in a little more. Um, there we go. Basically what you do is you, you pick an algorithm, and so I actually have four algorithms that I'm going through right here, a multicast decision jungle, a multi-class decision forest, and a couple others. And what's great is they're already, they're models that are already implemented in here that they know how to work. And so you can actually just pick some different parameters and various parameters. Uh, and then you, what you do is you, you split your data kind of in two sections. So it takes the data and it runs through it knowing the answer. And then it takes, and it splits out a chunk of the data without the answer and the answer being that quality. And based on the data that you trained it with, it tries to guess what the answer is for the other data. And so you can actually go through and run this and I already ran this, so um, I'll just so I'll show you briefly here. When you look, you can actually look at the result set. Visualize, and I can see I have four different algorithms that it did, and I can see what how accurate it was at predicting. So my um, multi-class uh, decision forest was the best one of the four algorithms in this particular case. Uh, it was 63% accurate, which really isn't the best accuracy, but this is a small data set. Um, but what I can do is, you know, I could go through and I could tweak some of the settings. Uh, let's scroll up here. I could treat, tweak some of the settings in here, you know, and look up and understand. And you, you'd want to look up and understand a little bit more about what you're doing, but you can tweak some of these settings and see if you can get it better, uh, if you can get a better guess. And so this is how you can kind of teach yourself some of this machine lear learning when you get some time with what your data scientists consult with them and, and get get an understanding of what you're doing a little better because they'll be able to explain it to you. But you know the the key point of showing this is there are tools out there that can help automate and visualize you know some of the data science techniques that data scientists use. And so just because just if you're not a data scientist, you can still go through and, and play around with some of this stuff. There's a ton of demos and training. Uh, you know, both for Azure and Google Cloud and Amazon Web Servers on, on a lot of this stuff. And so you can actually go through and, you know, teach yourself some, da some data science. So, so Lisa's given you a high-tech version about writing wine. I'll give you a low-tech version. <laughs> so I don't, I don't drink wine. I don't drink at all. And so I went to a Christmas party, and part of the party was everybody brought a bottle of wine. The host took it and put it in a bag immediately, put an A, B, C, D, E, F, G on it and then made up these little cards and had the names of all these wines and you were supposed to basically taste them all and then figure out, oh, A is a Merlot or a whatever. I don't know the names of them either. And so what I did is I walked around and talked to everybody and I said, oh, what, what color is a Merlot? And they would tell me and I'd say, and is a whatever, a, you know, the Chablis, is that like a really, you know, sour? Or what? I asked all these questions, everybody, and I filled out my card, and I won. <laughs> <laughs> and so his ears got all red, and he says, but how can you win? You didn't even taste anything. And I said, oh, I talked to a lot of people. <laughs> so I collected a lot of data and did some cross-analysis and came up with the information. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, how can your role, you guys are probably in various roles in your organizations, how can my role assist in data science? So, you know, the key to think about is use your strength, use what you're good at. I am good with dealing with massive amounts of data. I've done it for 20-something years. Uh, it's been my career, so I know how to wrangle data. I know how to process it quickly. I know how to store it efficiently. Um, you know, I lot, know a lot about database management systems. I know a lot about Hadoop. Uh, so I use that to my advantage, and I use that strength. So we talked about data science is a team sport. There are a lot of roles here. We're going to go through just a few of them. Business analyst. So a business analyst, this is what they do. They analyze an, organi and, uh, analyze an organization or business domain, and they document its business or process systems. They assess the business model or its integration with technology. 
They say if the data scientist is going to build models that capture the underlying patterns that govern the domain's behavior, someone has to help her understand what is the domain's behavior. That is a business analyst. So if you're a business analyst, that's a role that you hook up with data science people, you've got the business knowledge. You have a key ingredient. A database administrator. What's a database administrator do? DBAs use specialized software to store and organize data. They do capacity planning, database management, software installations, configuration, database design, data migration, performance monitoring, etc. They provide the infrastructure that's used by the data engineer. So if there is new database technology to be had, it's up to you, Ms. DBA, to bring that to the table. There's a talk that's coming up at 4 o'clock by a person from Nationwide who started out in, the, in the, this, this area, is that right? And so now she's a data scientist. We all know one in there and they raise her hand. And so being at that level, at that root level of understanding of data and how you parse it and how you manage it is the foyer into something greater in the data science area. A data engineer. So but there is a difference between a data scientist, one more clip for me. There's a difference between a data scientist and a data engineer. The, the engineer designs, he's, uh, he or she is the designer and the builder of the data infrastructure. They develop the architecture that helps analyze and process data in a way that the organization needs it. So they've got to process it into the way the organization needs to consume it. And there is a difference and a distinction between the data scientist and the data engineer, and they do have to work very closely together. So um, we had a person from Ford speak this morning, so let me give you an analogy in cars. So in cars, you have to understand the science of combustion in order to figure out how to make a car propel. But you also have to understand how to use that science of, of combustion and how to make parts that can move with a combustion that does this into a wheel that does that. So the scientist and the engineer work together to make the car move, always working together. Is software engineer, so this is my moving on to me. Software engineer. So um, obviously from this from the front end side, your software engineers that are writing the applications for your organization, if they don't collect the data and store the data somewhere, obviously you have no data to work with, right? So we need to so if you're a software engineer, think about when you're building an application, okay, what more do I need to collect or what inter what what kind of interact interactions am I having with my customer? What can I do with this? Talk to your data folks about Hey, what sh should I? How should I write this? Should I put what sort of format should I put these things in? And so, you know, what other things that you can do? Because again, if we don't have the data to begin with, we can't do any data science, right? Um, also, architect, which is my current role, is is doing is architecture. You know, without being able to have a consistent data strategy, a consistent set of tooling, uh, like visualization tooling, with one of my uh, vendors is here. Thank you for coming to my session, guys. Uh, <laughs> You know, the tooling and, pro and proper products to help work with your uh, your data. You know, then you're just going to have a mess, and you're going to have a whole bunch of different groups doing different things. And then you, and really, especially in large organizations where you can re where you really have a competitive advantage, is because you have a broad set of of data and a broad set of products that you can pull things together. Uh, project manager. Um, well, I'm married to a project manager, and I hate project managers. <laughs> but, uh, but yet, that's a good. But you need a good. Pro a good project manager is one that really gets on your nerves, especially if you're an engineer or an architect, because they're the ones that keep you on track, that keep you focused on the task at hand, and keep you focused on actually doing that business value, right? You're a project manager? Yeah. <laughs> be annoying. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> but, awesome. but be observant. Yes. Right? And ask those questions and be curious. And so they're, a really good project manager is one who absorbs what they're working on, not just says, oh, here's the date, and, and just pokes people to meet a date. Yeah. And then, of course, the data analyst. So the data analyst knows how to process the data, visualize the data, typically using a lot of visualization tools and techniques you know they work hand hopefully they work hand in hand with the business analyst uh, to really to really work with the data um, so I have a little funny story so again last week when I was at the Gartner data analytics summit we did there was a workshop for about an hour on for in the insurance industry so I was in there with all my competitors uh, we sat around at tables uh, I think auto owners insurance uh, progressive insurance was in there and three or four other insurance companies and we sat around the table together we all talked about 
you know, what do we need to enable artificial intelligence in our in our environment? We all, you know, it was an open forum. We all thought, yeah, our, I wish our AI was more mature than it really is. It it just it was relieving to feel that everybody felt that way. Um, you know, we can do AI better. We are, we're we're just we're trying to get into it, and you know, there's better ways we can do it. But one of the, but one of the questions we were given this worksheet, and you can see my awful handwriting. That's when I, that's why I'm in IT because you know I started typing because I can't write for bleep. Um, so one thing, what skills are needed for AI success? And you notice the third one down is data scientists, data engineer, architects, data governance, business with an exclamation point, project managers. These are all the things that we talked about that you need you know, in order to have AI success. So you, know, you can't just have data scientists. You obviously need data scientists, that's why I have that mark there. Uh, you know, but, you can't, but you can't have them. But you can't have data science without an entire team of folks. That's right, team sport. So, Data scientists need your help. Uh, this, is, uh, this is from a 2016 survey. The 2017 one, I didn't like the graphics as much, but it's pretty much the same numbers. Uh, a bunch of data scientists were polled as to what they spend their time doing. Uh, what is it, 60% is cleaning and organizing data. 19% is collecting data sets, so finding where the data is. Um, you know, so if you look here at, let's see, where's the, if you look here at this three, five, four, nine percent, that's building and training sets, mining data patterns, refining algorithms and other stuff. That's the actual data science work. So how much of a data scientist's work is actually data science? Like 20 percent, less than that, but I mean. And so, when we, and we said earlier, most data scientists are PhDs, you know, and you really want them working on the hard models, looking at the data and figuring out how do I make a model that models the behavior of the system I'm trying to turn into a tool for, for business value. And so guess what they don't like doing? Because they're the same poll showed a number thing of what do you like doing least, and that was this, the 60% organizing. They don't want to cleanse the data, they don't want to organize it, they just want to be able to produce their algorithms, you know, answer questions, and, and do those sorts of things. So, you know, what, so the way you can help enable data science as your organization is by helping with these parts right here. And in turn, the data scientists will have more time to help spread their data science knowledge across the organization and act as mentors, you know, and, and their, with, for what their subject matter experts in. So. Yeah, so know your business. How many times have we said that? Know your business. Know your business. Because if you don't really understand what the um, business is that you're trying to model, it's gonna be hard to know the, the right data to collect, to know how to challenge the model, to test the model, et cetera. Know your business. Uh, be curious. Think business value. You remember uh, Lisa's story about you know when they finally saw you know, the value in it. It was they were all for doing a, a new thing about uh, saving the data. Think business value. Think about what is it that this data that we're collecting could bring to the business. Ask questions. People that know me know that I am like a 90% of the time I'm asking questions. And it's really about challenging your own models as much as you're, re you're really not, for me, not challenging other people's models. You're asking questions to educate yourself, to challenge your own models, to put two and two together, to challenge the status quo. Self-blockers. We find that people, because you either don't have the education, you haven't had the exposure, somebody has told you you can't or whatever. Well, you're in this one silo of the business, so you, you can't get out of your swim lane, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about the team sport. Find a role that's on that team that you can do, or even maybe that you can volunteer to help one of those roles to get your foot in the door and start to learn more and get there. So remove your self-blockers. Use tools to learn and assist. Like we said, that marvelous thing out there called Google and every one of the cloud um, offerings, uh, Amazon, Azure, except they all have great education that goes along with them. So go out there and find if you are interested in, in actually learning up by education as well as vocation. Uh, online is great. And again, use your role and your strengths. So what you have yep. a good skill set in, use that to your advantage to help with, uh, with the organization as well. That's whole. right. Lead from strength. So again, key takeaway, always think about the data you have and think about how you can make it better, how you can organize things better. You know, use your skill sets and, and whatnot. So any questions? We have a microphone up here yes. if anyone would like okay. to walk I up. I think I have to turn it on. Yeah, I think it needs to be turned on. And hopefully it won't be as hot as mine. Look how mine was. We'll find out. And it's on. Please 
Okay. Oh, okay, it's on. Um, so I I completely agree, and outside of the joke that data scientists are uh, basically data analysts who live in California. Uh, <laughs> I, I heard that before, and since I'm coming from California, <laughs> I figured that people might find it funny. But so uh, obviously a lot of these different um, groups are supporting a lot of the data science and with the last kind of uh, diagram of how much of their work is somebody else job what do you think is the good way to actually describe to kind of more the ex executives and everyone else who right now think that data science machine learning and AI is like the hottest thing and that's all you need what do you use to explain that it cannot live without Everything else. That graph right there. <laughs> <laughs> plus, plus it, it, to create a mo first of all, AI has to have some amount of learning or models yeah. to go from. Somebody has to feed that into it or teach it how to, to look at a data to learn it. So you have to start with somebody who understands the business, who knows what data to go after, knows what data is good and what data isn't good to feed into those models. Yeah, and, and when you're talking to you know more folks on the executive team, you know, they're focused on business and business value. So when they say, we want to have a data science organization. Okay, I agree with you. Why? You know, what kind of value do you as, you know, my executive team want to get from the data science organization? And that'll help me understand what we should focus on first, what kind of skill sets we need, and what we can do. Because once you're able to show some value somewhere, and I think in the, in the Joy from Cardinal in the keynote thing at lunch today. You know, she talked about how they didn't have, uh, they didn't do any machine learning. Once they did a proof of concept and it proved value, then the, and everyone in the company wanted to do machine learning, right? So you know, it's just so just finding out, you know, what what kind of what the executives are really asking about. A lot of times, like you said, Doreen, asking more questions. Because um, yeah, if you know, I want to have a data science organization. Okay, what do you mean by that? Maybe they don't really mean data science. Maybe they just mean better data cataloging. Um, a more better data stewardship and things like that first, and, and then building a data science organization. So, so you know, so are you? You're actually getting pushback on you. You got a data analyst. Why do I need anybody else? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think it's just a good topic. It's yeah. it's the bigger problem is that everyone just talks about that without actually uh, attributing the hey. It's not just the data scientists that have yep. the success. It's because everyone else around them helps yes. them. Yes. Yep. So that's that's it's hard yep. to. Yep. So it's the team sport. Yep. Yes, it's a team sport. It's it's really the part that it everyone talks about it and it's how do you provide the value? How do you say that? I, I hey, you should be uh, saying thank you for the to I these people as it. well. Show them this, this chart because if you hired that very expensive data scientist and you said, now you have to do all this data cleansing and data organization, how much time is he, gonna, he or she going to spend up here? Yeah, you need the whole team to play all the parts. As you encourage people from other areas get into data science, are you afraid that um, people with uh, statistical knowledge or knowledge of the business are going to make things a little bit more, maybe come up with solutions that are not perfect and sometimes, sometimes misleading? Uh, that are not necessarily accurate? And yes, and that's why you always need to have a good data science organization. It just needs to be, you know, it's going to be relatively lean because I don't know if you've ever tried to hire a data scientist. Good luck. Um, you'll interview a lot of people that have data science in their resume that aren't necessarily data scientists, and you'll have very few actual data scientists uh, that you actually get a chance to interview. And when you do, and if you like them, you better hire them right away. Um, so I, at my previous job where I worked, we had a team of five data scientists. All of them were PhDs, and it took a year to hire that many. And I don't want to know how much my, I don't want to know how much they were offered, um, but it, but you know it took a while to hire most of them and find them. Um, but but is the reason why you collect data to challenge your models to make sure your model is correct? So if I'm building a model and I kind of don't really know what I'm doing and I build a model that's not quite right, if I put the right data through it pretty quickly, you'll be able to see. Like uh, you were saying, you had these four uh, analytic models here, and one of them did better than the other three. 
you can pretty quickly see, um, you know, and if, and if over and over and over again, the person's not coming up with the right kinds of models, it'll pretty quickly uh, kind of say they need some more education, they need some more insight, they need more business knowledge. And again, that's where you have your, you know, data science center of excellence that you go to that kind of validate and kind of approve of what, of what you're doing. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, um, my question is not directed towards career opportunities, but around this slide where 60% of the effort goes on cleansing. Yeah. How much are modelers trying to influence what kind of cleansing tools we need? To say, I cannot come up with a more optimal model because the data provided to me doesn't really get me what I want to address the business value. I have to assume that that feedback from the modeler that says the data is not cleansed correctly or isn't the right data has got to speak volumes. Um, is that that's the question you're asking? And or That's where you can go back and look, or you really want to need to go back and look at the, this raw source of the data and yep. see how it's collected. So a lot, again, we talked about, you know, the software engineer, you know, as part of that team involved in data science, you know, because if, if we don't have good data validation going in and we have a bunch of bad data in our system and we spend a lot of time trying to cleanse it, you know, in our ETL processes and things like that, and that's very expensive and very costly and that it erodes the business value if your data is not good. If you have, I'd rather have no data than bad data personally. And, um, and a, a real flag is if you are having to repetitively cleanse, quote, the same data over and over which says that it's being used in some way that is manipulating it and, you know, um, you, you you got something wrong in one of your uh, processes somewhere. Yeah. So um, here, uh, my question is: So nowadays, like you see a lot of these hot terms like data science, machine learning, AI, and then like each of the organization trying to create this culture, but then people start to abuse that term. So I remember when cloud first introduced, uh, uh, and. I'm from I know, so don't don't blame me after this. So when cloud first introduced, I noticed that just a little bit automation. I started calling it cloud, but it's not true cloud. So same for data science. Like people just do like a little bit, and then they call like they use these fancy machine learning A/B tests. But at the end, it's just uh, statistics hypothesis testing. So like, do we do we adapt to this kind of culture or like? Do we try to correct it, or like how 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 do we handle such <coughs> scenarios? I sometimes don't feel comfortable using those words because I know it's not what it tru truly means, and the uh, organization practice is not what exactly that is. Yep, yeah, that's that's a really good call out. And so, um, ironically, since you mentioned cloud, uh, I'm, we're doing a, part of my role at, at um, Nationwide is, you know, setting strategic direction. And so actually tomorrow we're releasing our cloud statement of direction internally at Nationwide. And so we're one of the thing, one of the first things we're doing in our, you know, de we're, we're, we're going to declare kind of our cloud strategy to the organization is defining the word cloud and what we mean by it. So that everyone across Nationwide understand, it seems silly that you should yeah. have, you know, definitions, but every company is going to define things a little bit differently, right? If you've ever gone from job to job, you may you hear these di the same word, but it mean may mean something totally different. You know, because uh, some of the confusion we've had, at, you know, at, at, no, I've had in multiple companies. When I say cloud, does that mean a public cloud vendor like Azure AWS, or does that also mean cloud? Is in I build a private cloud right. internally uh, in my organization, like using virtualization and automation and things like that, or like you said, I just automate things. Does that mean cloud? Uh, you know. So, you know, so making you're talking sure about a good data dictionary. A right? good data dictionary. Making sure your organization actually has these defined in documents where you can go back and see this is what we define as X. It sounds kind of silly, but if you're not talking uh, the same language, you know, you're going to have a hard time executing the same strategy. That's right. And it really is up to the company and uh, basically putting the statements of direction, putting the data, um, data dictionary together. And then I think it is appropriate if you find somebody misusing it, say, I don't, I'm not sure that that's the definition of the data dictionary would be, you know, kind of a nice way to challenge them. Yeah, is, should we, can we have a discussion to actually have a nice, you know, holistic organizational view of what, that, of what the definition of this is? Um. In, in my experience with, with data science, there seems to be at times a, a disconnect in the way that data scientists um, or people on that team are communicating with executives or other members of an organization. 
I, I don't see up on that chart in particular them spending any other time unless it's included in other, uh, the communication of maybe the medium that's being used, the tool that's being used, or the algorithm, being able to dilute that down to a simple process and explain it to people who aren't necessarily data science minded. So what would your recommendation be on the best medium to use or the best role on a team to fill that, that void? I think it's going to depend on your data scientist. So I've seen data scientists who are very good at going, rolling it up high level and giving you know three sentence kinds of reviews for uh, the non-data scientists that, that, that get it right away. And then you have others that come in with you know 18,000 page whatever, you know, white paper to try and explain. So I think it depends on, and, and they're both really good data scientists at building models and, and really taking uh, something that's very complex and creating a good model to get the behavior out of it. It depends on you know the data scientists and the roles around you in the team. So you look to your business analyst. Look to maybe even your data analyst or your project manager. It depends, again, on the skills, communication skills in the team. And then, of course, who is the data scientist's direct uh, executive? Maybe that executive needs to get more active in the communications portion for a data scientist who doesn't know how to roll it up well. Yeah, yeah, and that's where I would say I would stick to mostly the data analyst and business analysts in that particular scenario to make sure that they kind of sit with the data scientists and they understand what's happening, and then they can take the output that the data scientist generates and produce that in a in a more you know business proper format instead of something that's all you know. If you have an executive, don't get all sciencey on me. You know, I, I want to see a pretty graph. You know, executives love charts and graphs. And so if you show them a bunch of numbers, their eyes will blow over. You show them a chart, usually with the arrow going up, <laughs> they're happy. Okay. I think and, we have time for one more question. But it is, it is good feedback for the data scientist who doesn't have a good executive communication style. That, that's really important also. I work in implementation, so back to that 60%. Yeah. How, from your experience, um, how, you know, planning or, or having the right tools for, you know, track the data or collect the data would minimize that 60%? Um, that's a good question. A lot of it is just is having um, a consistent strategy across the enterprise. Um, you know, and you know, we always say we always log customer activity in X fashion across different lines of business within the organization. And that way you can utilize similar processes uh, for different use cases and produce good data from that. And that, the things like that helps shrink that number. You've been a great audience. I mean, yes. every person I looked at, you were obviously engaged with us, so I appreciate it. It makes it easy to speak when you're engaged yeah, like And this. right Thank after you. lunch. Yeah, thank you guys for coming.